the Bible says, and that's a blessing. Amen. Today we're going to be studying from Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. And this is called an Amber Alert. An Amber Alert is named after a girl named Amber who turned up missing. And what followed uh, created a, you know, a, a protocol for what to do if a child is missing. And since 1996, when Amber Alerts became formed, that association and all, I understand there have been 495 success stories. Kentucky just had a success story uh, in December of 2014, so just last month. Uh, a guy stole a car. Uh, the mother of one of the children went inside of a gas station. This guy gets in the car, steals it. There's a baby in the back seat. So they do the Amber Alert. Uh, there's an Amber Alert set up in every state. Uh, all 50 states, also Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and uh, Washington, D.C. But they send text messages to large groups of people, you know, look for a baby, a, a car was gone, it's missing, and, and that kind of thing. So evidently when the thief, when he realized that, you know, the baby's crying in the back seat or something, he just left the car like 15 minutes away. But people who got the message, you know, responded that that car is sitting here in the parking lot. And they were able to get the baby back to his mother and things, and uh, that's a good thing. Amen. And that's where we're looking at Luke 2 today. It's an Amber Alert because there's a baby missing. And this is not just any baby. And in fact, he's 12 years old now. So he's a young man, but he's missing. Not just for a little while. You know, my heart skipped a beat when the young runs in another room. And, and I thought he was with you, and you thought he was with me. And where's he at? This is three days. Three days that Jesus is missing. And I encourage you to turn there and, and go along with me. These 12 verses of Scripture in Luke chapter 2, verse 41 to 52, the Bible says this. Every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were <coughs> astonished. His mother said to him, <clears throat> Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them, and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today above every blessing. For Jesus, we were all lost and you sent us a Savior, a Redeemer, a Rescuer, the one from your presence, from the third heaven, who became one of us, who overcame sin and then overcame the grave and through Him we found victory today. We thank you for Jesus. Father, may your word be preached here. May you be glorified. Lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. We exist for your glory. It's why we were born. 
We pray you grow your church because the increase is always yours, no matter who plants or who waters the seed. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Luke 2, verse 41, it says this, the Bible does, it says, Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. Now the feast of the Passover, that, that commemorates how God led the Israelites. You've heard of a guy named Moses, right? Moses. Let my people go. And, and God let, leads the people, uses Moses to do it out of Egypt. And the last of the ten miracles was to kill the firstborn, or God killed the firstborn of all in Egypt. And the Israelites, to escape that judgment coming on Egypt, they had to kill the lamb. And they had to apply the blood in the correct way. The Passover. If you applied the blood in the correct way, the death angel passed over that house. So the Israelites were saved, but those in Egypt who hadn't applied the blood, it cost them the lives of their firstborn children. The Passover. The Passover is one of three feasts that the males were expected to go to Jerusalem to celebrate. Passover occurs, and you know about it, you celebrate it every year, you just don't know it. We celebrate it, we call it Easter. Because Jesus raised from the dead after the Passover on the first day of the week, you see. The Passover occurs on the first full moon after the vernal equinox. That's how they said it changes every year. That's why Easter changes every year. That's the way the Passover is established. The second feast is Pentecost. That's 50 days, seven weeks in a day. 50 days after Passover is Pentecost. All the males are supposed to attend. Uh, in the fall of the year, the Feast of Tabernacles, that's at the end of September or the 1st of October, every year. Three feasts that the Jewish people are supposed to celebrate. Jewish men are required to go. Josephus, a Jewish historian, says, in Jesus' day there were about two million people who celebrated the Feast of the Passover in Jerusalem. Two million. That blows Apple Day out of water, you know. That's a lot. Two million people. So it's a big deal, and none of this Mary and Joseph are going. Now I want you to think about that. Think about Mary and Joseph going to Jerusalem. Because see, this is from Nazareth, their hometown, to Jerusalem as a crow flies, straight shot at 63 miles. But to go around Samaria like they did, as was custom, this is over a 100 mile journey. 100 miles when you're walking, that's a real long way, you know. But they go up to the feast according to the custom. Can you see that just because, just because Moses wrote this a few years ago, that's what Moses said we should do? That's what Mary and Joseph are doing. You see that, right? You see there, they're making a statement. You choose who you're going to serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Even if it's three times a year. Even if it's a hundred mile journey. Even if it's a dangerous trip, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's what they do. They go up to Jerusalem according to the custom, and they celebrate the feast. Now you generally, the Jewish people, it took eight days to celebrate Passover. They killed the lamb on the first day, and then for seven days they would feast, and they would celebrate. It's a big party. It's eight days. And after the partying, after the celebration was over, his parents are heading back home. They got friends and neighbors. We know with them. They are heading that way, a hundred mile journey, and they start off on their trip. But the Bible says, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem and his parents were unaware of it. <coughs> that says quite a bit, doesn't it? First off, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. Now, you got to understand this young man's perfect. I mean, uh, you think your young man's perfect, <laughs> but he's not. But this young man really was perfect. And the Bible says about him in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, tempted even as we are yet without sin. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. No sin. He'd never been in trouble. He'd never been somewhere where he wasn't supposed to be. Why would Mary and Joseph be paying extra attention to where he was? 
That boy never causes us any problem. In fact, he's perfect. They're not paying special attention to him, for one thing. For another thing, do you know, I mean, some people don't believe this, but the Bible teaches, in Mark chapter 6, Jesus had brothers and sisters, you know. In Mark chapter 6, his brothers are named uh, James, Judas, uh, Joseph, and Simon. Four brothers, Mark chapter 6. And then it says he has sisters. We don't even know how many. Do you understand? It's very likely. It's very likely that he has younger brothers and sisters at this point. I mean, he's the oldest child. You know, we, we got diapers to change. You know, get the pampers. Get the baby wipes. But you know they didn't do it that way, right? <laughs> but get the stuff, you know. We, we got we to get these young ones taken care of and they can't take care of themselves. And it's easy to overlook when you got several young ones, you know. The oldest one who never causes you any problem anyway, and he's taking care of himself, and they're busy. He stays behind in Jerusalem. They leave for Nazareth, and they leave him behind. They got no clue. The Bible says they think that he is in their company, and they travel on for a whole day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. And we all know that feeling. For, for us, I don't know if there's anything it's, <clears throat> that we can relate to. And when I say we, I mean my generation. <clears throat> you reach for your cell phone. And it's not there. <laughs> it's, you know, it's on the pouch. Or it's supposed to be in the pouch. It's supposed to be in the pocket. And you, you know my generation. You see us all the time. We're doing this number. And, and we're texting and we're searching. And if you tell something, we're going to Google it. Just check you out. And when you don't have your phone, man, can we still survive without it? There's a strong argument there, okay? But you know what it's about. I mean, it's, it's your purse that you can't find. It's your pocketbook. It's when you got your wallet and you get it out and the credit card's gone. Where did I have that thing last? Just the feeling of not having something really important. And have you ever left a youngin' somewhere? It's not like Mary and Joseph were the only ones who ever done that, you know. I was left one time at church. <laughs> I've shared that before. still share it with you. I was two years old. I was in the car seat. They left the car seat to me in it. Left us at church. Now, how does that happen? I, they came back and if I hadn't cried I was sleeping peacefully and they never do it <laughs> that can happen man but they realize they travel today they're on a journey it's a hard journey they begin to look for him you know where's Jesus at and just imagine the commotion two million people packing up going here and there the, the Passover's over the eight days of celebration it's all wrapped up and everybody's going to his respective home and, and you know what uh, Joseph is loading the camels up you know and Mary says uh, get the GPS because you know you don't want to stop and ask for directions and they got stuff they got diapers to get and young ones that they're chasing around and has anybody seen Jesus? well he was with John the Baptist and they had slingshots and they're playing let's kill Goliath so I thought Where's he at? Shouldn't he be here? And they just assume, you know, uh, well, he's probably our relatives. And we know in Luke chapter 1, Mary and Elizabeth are relatives. That means Jesus and John the Baptist are relatives. And perhaps they did play together regularly. We don't know if they're together now. But they're friends and they're relatives. And well, if he's not here, he must be down there. Just go check their tent. Just go check and see if he's with them. He's walked, you know, we followed them in. They start looking. But they don't find him. The Bible says when they did not find him, <clears throat> they went back to Jerusalem. Now I want you to just imagine here. This youngin is missing. And what do you think when something's not where it's at? You know? somebody, somebody stole it. I mean, that's my first thought, you know, when my shoes aren't in the right place in my own house. And I know some of y'all just like me, because my mom used to say this, you know, where, where, son, where did you have them last? <laughs> She had to take me by the hand. Where did you have it last, son? And now my wife, what does she do? She takes me by the hand. She leaves me. Honey, where did you have them last? What did you do? Somebody moved them. Somebody took them. It ain't my fault. Right? But it is most of the time. Okay, all the time. They can't find, they can't find the baby. But, but put, it, put it in perspective here. This is, not just, this is not just a baby. You remember in Luke chapter 1 how... Uh, the angel Gabriel went to Mary and he said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Remember that? This child, he will be great. He will reign on David's throne and over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. 
The virgin will be with child, Isaiah said, and she was. And they give birth, and the shepherds come in off the hillside or wherever they're at, and, and, and they worship this youngin as the angel had instructed. This, this is God's young. This is God's child. This is the promised one. This is what the Old Testament was hanging on. This promised child to come. And Mary, you lost him. <laughs> and where's he at? And you just assume the worst. Somebody stole him. A thief has jumped him. I mean, maybe he was along the trail. He was coming. Maybe he fell down. He got hurt. He bumped his head. He's unconscious along the road. And they go through this, this you know, this logical progression here. Of where could he be? Where did we see him last? And then we start interviewing people. Where did you see Have you seen Jesus? Have you been playing with Jesus? Where did you see him at? Well, last time I seen him was in Jerusalem. And they go back to Jerusalem to look for him. The Bible says they find him after three days. Now you could read it that you know they, they return to Jerusalem and it takes three more days to find them. That's a possibility, but it's generally accepted that they travel for a day, they take a day to travel back, and then they find him on the third day. But there clearly there are two possibilities there at least. Nonetheless, it says after three days, they find Jesus in the temple courts. When they find him, he's sitting among the teachers, listening to them, he's asking them questions. And it says everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. And that's something to keep in perspective. Some people just assume, you know, Jesus was popular because he worked miracles. That's definitely true. But Jesus was popular when he wasn't working miracles. For the same reason, see, he's 12 years old. And this, this account only occurs in the Gospel of Luke. Matthew, Mark, and uh, John are silent about this one account of Jesus being 12 years old as a young man. But we get it here in Luke. And we get him, our Savior, the King of glory. We get him as a young man, and as he listens and he asks questions, he's amazing everybody. It's important we realize. Jesus taught with authority. He spoke with authority. As in Matthew chapter 7, after the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it says he amazed the crowds because he spoke with authority and because of what he taught. He did that as an old man in his ministry, you know, an old man, 30 years old, 33. And he did that as a young man, that's 12 years old. Nonetheless, they find him in the temple. And they ask him, uh, Son, Mary said, Why have you treated us like this? And I think that's when your mama calls out to you and she uses that middle name just to show, you know, she knows your middle name and you're in trouble. Son, why have you treated us like this? Didn't you know we were anxiously searching for you? Do you think they were anxiously searching for that boy? Do your head like this right here. You better believe it. He says to them, notice in Luke's Gospel, this is, these are the first recorded words of Jesus. And notice what he says. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Luke records the first words of Jesus in chapter 2. In 21 more chapters, he will record the last words of Jesus in Luke chapter 23, verse 46. When Jesus says his last of all of his sayings on the cross, all seven things he says on the cross, Jesus looks into heaven, Matthew 20, or Luke. 23 verse 46 and Jesus says Father into your hands I commit my spirit and how perfect it is that the first words of Jesus and the last words of Jesus and all in between it's all about the Father you know what Jesus said in John's gospel chapter 8 verse 29 Jesus said the Father never leaves me because I always do what pleases Him without exception <clears throat> He was God. He was God in the flesh. But He was completely submissive to the Father. And that's why He prayed in the garden. You've read it probably. Father, if it's Your will, may this cup pass for me. But if not, may Your will be done. Always submissive to the Father. And Amber alert, where's the baby at? What's happened? Is he okay? Is he safe? Three days. They find him in the temple. He's safe and sound. The Bible says they have this conversation and it says then, then he went down to Nazareth with them 
and was obedient to them. And that says a lot to your kids and to mine and to all of us. It brings us though to the point of the sermon where we ask the question, what about me? What about you? Well, we see what the Bible says and how does it apply to life? I was hoping you would ask that today. First off, we see Mary and Joseph's example. They're going up to, the, up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. It's one of three feasts they attended. Because that's what the Bible said to do. That's what the law of Moses said to do. Now do you realize, you know, Jesus was born about 2,000, about 2,000 years ago. We're in 2015 now, you know. So it's been a little more, but about, about 2,000 years ago. Do you realize that Moses recorded the law of Moses some 1,400 years before Jesus? 1,400 years. The law of Moses was as old and ancient to them in the days of Jesus as the New Testament is to us. And some, some skeptics look at it. That, that's just an old archaic book, man. Now, surely you're not going to still live and try to live by that thing. It's so out of place and unpractical. It's the Word of God. And what separates the obedient from the, un, from the disobedient is people who accept it and live by it. And, and what Joshua said before he died in his farewell dress is the life that Mary and Joseph lived is the life that other saints lived and it's the choice you have. Choose whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And when somebody asks you, are you still, are you still, you know, reading this Bible thing? Are you still doing this, uh, this biblical and the virgin birth? You really believe a virgin could, could give birth? You better believe it. Well, what are you doing? What are you doing with your time and your money? Well, I consider what God wants me to do with my time, with my money, and with everything else He gives me. It's it's the way it is when you believe the Bible's the word of God. <laughs> For me, and my house will serve the Lord, and if you want to follow Jesus. You need to follow what's in the old and archaic book we call the Bible. People who follow Jesus in the New Testament, they were told to believe. Occasionally in the book of Acts when you read it, uh, you know at least once or twice they're told to repent. At least once in Acts chapter 8, Philip was told, uh, Philip told the Ethiopian eunuch to confess. Every single person was baptized into Christ immediately for the forgiveness of sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Are you going to do that today? You're going to obey this old and ancient book? It's the Word of God. Amen. Amen. And what Joshua said applied to Mary and Joseph, it applies to me and you. Choose this day whom you will serve. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What about you? In this account, in Luke chapter 2, this Amber Alert, can you hear what the Bible says, what the Scripture says to children? He went down to Nazareth, Jesus did, and was obedient to them. That's not just found in, about Jesus. That's instruction for all of us. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, the Bible says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You, you can say amen. <laughs> Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> For this is right. And the next two verses say, Honor your father and mother. It's the first commandment with the promise that you'll enjoy a long life on the earth. And how many of us are a little older today than what we ever would have been because we listened to somebody who loved us and told us what to do and what not to do? It's true. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Children, don't disrespect your parents. Don't talk to them disrespectfully. Don't, don't when other, people, other kids are bashing their parents, don't jump in on it because you are supposed to represent what God would have you to do. An example you need to follow is to be obedient to your parents just like Jesus. Your parents are not always right. In fact, they make fools of themselves sometimes. They're not perfect and that's not the point. You're told to obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. I encourage you to respect your parents. Whether we're young or whether we're old, we're told to respect our parents. And the way I read it, I can't find anywhere it says we outgrow it. You know it. Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Children, obey your parents. That's what God expects you to do. Secondly, it's from the child's perspective, but it's also from the parent's perspective, you know. And to get to the parent's perspective, especially with children, because that's what we're talking about today, an Amber Alert, child missing, 
taking care of children. Well, we really got to establish one important fact here is this. Everything belongs to God. Now what you say? I said everything belongs to God. Well, where do you get that at? Well, one place I get that at is in Psalm chapter 50. It says this. Every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills, and the creatures of the field are mine, for the world is mine, and all, all that is in it. God says it all belongs to me. It's all mine. Now see, that challenges our belief. Because from the time we're sitting in a Sunday school classroom, a little girl, she's this big, she's got beautiful, you know, uh, blue eyes, blonde hair, and she's got her little doll, and she's just happy as she can be, she's sweet as she can be, until a snotty nosed little boy <laughs> comes and takes her doll away. And she can, in an instant, unleash some fury like that of exorcist type proportion. <laughs> because why? It's mine. Mine, mine, mine. It's perhaps the first four letter word we know is mine. <laughs> And it's a lie. It's not yours. It all belongs to God. The whole world belongs to God. Nothing's yours. You don't get to keep any of it, do you? It all belongs to God. And you say, well, preacher, I mean, we've got bills to pay. We've got things to do, legitimate needs, and I've got stuff I've got to take care of. We've got to make a living, you know. Well, the Bible says that's God's too. Where does it say that at? Haggai chapter 2, verse 8, it says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. He got all that too. It's all, it all belongs to him. So when you put it in perspective, children, they may have your name. They may be cursed to look like us, you know. They can't help it. But they're not really ours. They're God's. Hannah prayed this in 1 Samuel, 20, uh, 1 Samuel 1 verse 27. I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I ask of him. And you may be sitting here today saying, I didn't ask for it. <laughs> But you got it anyway. And the Bible teaches us there's some most intelligent people on the planet that believe they came, they descended from apes and stuff. And that is such a shame. The Bible teaches you're created in the image of God. The Bible teaches that you are made to know the difference. We've eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God wants you to know the difference between good and evil, you see. The Bible, wants, the Bible teaches you're made to be a person with integrity. To know the difference, to stand for what's right. The Bible teaches heaven's in, heaven's real, and you're supposed to be there for all time, for all time in His presence. And when you put it in perspective, these children belong to God. They're not ours; they're God's, and we're responsible with what we do with them. That puts a new spin on this thing: childbearing, you know, child rearing. How do we treat them? What do we do? Do you know before a child turns eighteen? You've got 936 chances to have them in church on Sunday. You know that? You know, Sunday school, if you just show up, it don't cost any more. We charge the same price for Sunday school as you get for service, you know. It's free. You just come a little bit early, which in my case, that helps me to get to service on time. Because I'm late for Sunday school, but I'm here on time. But you come earlier, your friends get, you know, Christian friends, they get Christian principles, maybe some spiritual mentors. It ain't Disney World, but at least it tries to be fun. It's age-appropriate material that you can instill in your children from a time they're this high. Amen. And if your children are over nine years old, you've already blown half the chances. If you haven't had a practice to have them in the Lord's company of the Lord's people on the Lord's day, you're responsible. Your children are going to stand before the judgment seat of God just like you are. And, and whether they get into the heavenly abode or not largely depends on what you do today. God's trusted you with a soul. Mm -hmm. A soul. Some people got money that God trusts them with. For most of us, that's not us. You know, it's okay. Some people got stuff and property and you know, thousands of acres and all this kind of stuff and servants and all this. God's given you a soul. It's the greatest of all gifts in that way, perhaps. There's an argument. Creating the image of God and you're responsible. And what do you do with it? Mary just about dropped the ball, or so she thought here. But Jesus was exactly where He was supposed to be. You see. Have you dropped the ball with your kids? If, if you made mistakes yesterday, we all have, but are you going to get it right today? That's the question. 
Children are a gift from the Lord. And in fact, when you study the Bible, you find this practice and principle is every good and perfect gift comes from above. Everything that's good and perfect, it comes from heaven. It all belongs to God. Every animal of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills, the earth is mine, everything in it, silver and gold are mine, declares the Lord Almighty. And every good and perfect gift comes from above. What kind of steward are you? This story, more than anything else, is, is a story of stewardship. And it requires us, it demands that we examine our lives to find out what kind of stewards that we are, what kind of stewards we have been, what kind of stewards we're going to be. I'm here to encourage you every step of the way. You find life that's only found in Jesus Christ, you live for His glory, and heaven can be your home through faith and obedience because the grace of God is sufficient. Amen. In Luke chapter 2, a sermon that I called an Amber Alert. An Amber Alert, a missing child. What we're going to do, we're going to send text message in mass quantity so people will be on the lookout. That doesn't apply so well for this story of Jesus in Luke chapter 2. But it does apply for us today. You see, I got a text message. And it looks like this. A text message, the first, and there'll be none like it forevermore. It's called the Bible. And the text message says this, there's some children missing out here, man. There's some children who made a mess of their own lives. They're falling on their own faces. And maybe it's drugs, and maybe it's sex, and maybe it's pornography, maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's gambling. They're children of mine that are falling on their face. And they're ruining their lives and their livelihood. And I want them to live with the hope of heaven. I want them to live not afraid of the grave because I overcame it. I want them to live with hope. And children of mine are defeated and downcast because they haven't received my goodness. And the text message reads, through a thousand different verses you can pull, just like this. Bring my children in. God says, Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. You're made in His image. You know the difference from right and wrong. You know the tomb of Jesus is empty. You know His blood can have all your sins forgiven. All that was, all that will be. You know you can live with hope. The Amber Alert today is for you. God says, will you come home today? And that's the invitation.